was very very lively. So um, at this point, it's my it's my pleasure to uh, announce the second speaker, and I'm very delighted that he could make the time to come today. So I would like to introduce, while he's uh, setting up, John Mattison. John Mattison is the Chief Medical Information Officer at Kaiser Permanente. John directed the largest and first deployment of Kaiser Permanente Health Connect, Kaiser Permanente's revolutionary program to improve the quality and safety of healthcare through the use of information technology. <coughs> the program supports the largest region of Kaiser Permanente with more than 3 million patients and is used by over 5,000 physicians in 13 hospitals and 140 clinics. So, uh, John and I met for the first time at the Salk Institute uh, probably a year ago. We had a very brief but very intense and uh, enlightening discussion. So, um, having uh, planned the event together with, uh, with Micha for today, uh, I reached out to him, uh, of course, more assuming that he forgot about that we've met to begin with, but he didn't. And uh, he uh, immediately uh, responded positively to, to present for today's meeting. And I'm uh, very glad that John uh, could, could make it today. So I think after um, you are set up, John. Great, thank you. So can you hear me okay? Is the mic good? Great, thanks. Well, it's a privilege to be here today at Sunhai, um, and I really, uh, really do appreciate the opportunity um, to speak with you, and I hope that um, we'll be able to uh, have a, a good, lively Q&A like the last one. Um, I want to make a couple of quick comments, though. Uh, Sunhai uh, is directed to uh, bring together people from different disciplines to create interaction between domains of knowledge. Um, and that's the space that I like to live in most. And I've actually invented a term that when I uh, Googled it uh, a couple of years ago, I got zero hits. And this morning, I'm pleased to announce that there's 613 hits uh, on the term. Um, and I got a text yesterday from a friend who said, great interview um, in Healthcare IT News, and the, the title um, of the interview, what in fact used the term I invented several years ago, and it's Plico System, which is a multi-platform, it's a contraction of multi-platform ecosystem. And so if you Google it now, there are 613 hits uh, from a total of zero two years ago. Um, so I'm very pleased about that. Um, but that is what Sunhai is about, and that's the space that I live in. So this is a great intersection. I, I appreciate the privilege of being able to talk to you today. Uh, a couple of quick things. If you look closely at the agenda for today, um, I, I asked if I could have a fair amount of time to speak to you, but I promise I won't speak until 1 a.m. Um, I'll, I'll be done by midnight uh, for sure, because uh, the, the time says 11.30 to 1 a.m. Um, please interrupt me at any point in time because I am inclined to uh, digress into techno geek speak, and so please stop me. And, if, and, and the, the, thing, the reason I love to talk is not to hear me say what I already know, but it's to get the kind of Q&A like we just had, um, and I would appreciate you interrupting me at any point. I just want to say that um, uh, I'm often asked, so when are you going to retire? Um, and whenever anybody asks my, me that question, I get this image in my head, and the image in my head is Richard Delapena, um, who is the founder of Independa, um, because uh, having been fortunate enough to be a dear friend of Richard's and uh, at his retirement party, um, when he left my institution, Kaiser Permanente, um, uh, that was just the beginning of Independa. It wasn't Richard's retirement. And so both my father and my grandfather were surgeons, and they did surgery actively into their 80s. Um, and so when someone asks me if I retire, I think of, of Richard and, and my father and grandfather and, and say, I don't understand what you're, you're asking me. Um, 
The, the other thing, I want to reflect on a couple of things that were just covered because this, what you just heard um, about Independa is so dead on in every respect. And it's no surprise to me to see where Independa is today because having had the privilege of being Richard's friend over many years, decades actually, um, he understands the core human values that drive health and wellness. And that's what Independa is, is choosing to pursue. Um, and a full disclosure, I have no equity position in any startups. I do mentor hundreds of them. I have no equity in Independa. Um, so my plug for them is genuine, based upon uh, my affection for Richard and what he's doing, and my respect for, for the approach of that company. I think it's just brilliant. Um, some of the things they mentioned were person-centric approach as opposed to a doctor-centric or a patient-centric, or a consumer-centric. So if you, if you look at a lot of the current literature in healthcare transformation today, they talk about, oh, the new revolution is patient-centric. No, 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 wait, it's consumer-centric. Well, actually, it's neither of those. Um, we are people, um, first and foremost, and health and wellness depend upon our entire life, mind, body, soul, spirit. Um, and if we don't address those issues, we're missing the boat. Independence got it dead on. Um, one thing I'll just mention um, is that uh, there, uh, there's a lot going on in robotics today, um, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later, um, but there is now the coolest robot on the planet, and it's called Pepper, and the reason it's the coolest robot on the planet is that it doesn't uh, wash your dishes, it doesn't bring you food, it doesn't... Um, <coughs> Uh, clean your, your, your floor, like Roomba, and we have two of those and I love them. Um, but what it does is it's a social interaction for this, this whole idea of social isolation. So there, while I completely agree with many of the comments during the Q&A earlier, um, that social isolation is a big problem. Um, and while I completely agree that human-to-human -human touch is so critically important, and I will come back to that in some detail, um, I, I don't entirely discount the role of technology in addressing some of those needs. So Pepper is designed to be uh, a social interaction. It actually reads your facial expressions to know how you're feeling, and it carries on a dialogue with you based upon what it knows about you, what you're saying, and how you're feeling based upon uh, the artificial intelligence associated with reading your emotional state. So. Um, this boundary between uh, technology and humanism um, is getting very, very interesting. And, and many of you probably heard the two um, very, very accomplished people who recently um, took artificial intelligence to task. Uh, Elon Musk, um, who tweeted yesterday, close but no cigar, when he tried to land a 12-story rocket ship on a platform in the middle of the ocean, and it almost worked. Um, has said about uh, AI that uh, AI is the invitation to the devil. Okay, I don't know how many of you saw that, but uh, that was just a couple weeks ago. And Stephen Hawking, the uh, uh, renowned physicist and subject of uh, the current movie, um, has said that AI is going to extinguish the human species. And so if you, if you look at what artificial intelligence and robotics are, how quickly they're evolving, um, and how superior the machine is to the human in everything related to sensing and computation and complex thinking, you can understand why they're worried. And so Ray Kurzweil, co-founder of Singularity University, um, where I teach every year um, in the Exponential Medicine course, um, has written a book called Abundance, which Bill Clinton has just named his favorite book of the year, and he's having a fireside chat with uh, Peter Diamandis soon uh, on that topic, um, where they talk about this utopian view of where AI and robotics is going. Um, there's also some dystopian books written about where this is all going, some of them as old as Aldous Huxley um, and his work, and some more current ones like The Second Machine Age, which I highly recommend that you read. And so, Given that I like to invent new words, um, I invented another one. Just uh, I was keynoting a, a machine learning conference in Montreal a month ago. Um, it's the biggest machine learning conference uh, internationally every year. And um, I, I have been playing with the, this notion of the singularity and what Elon Musk and, and 
uh, Hawking's recently said. And um, my construct is not that we're headed towards a singularity of all the machinery. We're headed towards a dyadarity, okay, two, dyad, where we very clearly define the role of humans, which is about values and about emotions and about reconciling conflicting values very explicitly, very transparently, so that we have a, a mechanism for ensuring that AI neither becomes the devil nor causes the extinction of the human species. Because I do believe that Elon Musk and uh, Hawking are, are onto something really big, because if you look at where machine learning and deep learning is going, with layers upon layers of either neural nets or layers upon layers of Bayesian logic and Bayesian learning, um, it is very quickly exceeding the capacity of the human mind to think and create. So um, there's a very, very rich um, dialogue that we need to have. And um, this boundary between human and machine is going to be increasingly important um, as we get deeper and deeper into the technologies. So the title of the, my talk today um, is Using Modern Technologies to Restore Ancient Wisdom, and it very much speaks to the human side of the world. Um, I did lead the largest health record project um, in the country at Kaiser Permanente, um, but I, as I was doing that project, I was telling everybody, this is transformational uh, for um, our members is transformational for healthcare, but it's only the, we're just pouring the concrete. This is not the solution. And recently the federal government spent tens of billions of dollars incentivizing implementation of electronic health records. And there's been a lot of backlash to that spend and the outcome of it because it hasn't done anything but raise the cost of healthcare further because it's allowed people to do better coding to get better reimbursement from CMS. So the, the RAND Corporation, issued a report about six years ago that said we were going to save $82 billion with the implementation of health records. And since the tens of billions have been on an annual basis, um, and since uh, the uh, $42 billion has been spent incentivizing the broad and widespread deployment of health records, the health care costs have gone up by hundreds of billions of dollars, not down by $82 billion. So Rand Corporation, different group of folks conveniently could say, oops, um, five years ago, our projections were a little bit off. The reason is that what we really need is, is um, entrepreneurs like Richard and team uh, with Independa to build upon the platform of data that we're creating with health records, not that health records are the be-all, end-all. So I spent, I completed our health record project about six years ago, so I spent the last six years working on um, integration of the different elements of what I call the, the healthcare plico system uh, to bring about change, and I think Independent is a good example. So uh, Sunhai is, is, is a great example of interdisciplinary thinking, and that's what I'm going to address in my comments today. So please do interrupt me at any time, and hopefully we'll have time for Q&A at the end as well. So uh, my first slide is really an homage. Um, this is the vision of integrated healthcare systems, uh, technology systems, that was created by the physician founder of Kaiser Permanente, Sidney Garfield. The only thing of significance to note is in the lower right-hand corner, he published this 45 years ago in Scientific American, and we just completed his vision, executing his vision about six years ago. Um, and uh, the slide um, that I used as the business case, so uh, the, the part of the project that I led, um, uh, cost upwards of uh, $3 billion, uh, but we came in a year ahead of schedule and $267 million under budget because of a lot of cultural transformation we were doing during the implementation of the technology. But this is a slide that I use, a single slide, to explain the business case for um, transforming healthcare with, with digital medicine, and that is shortening the cycle time. So it's well documented that in the paper world, it was typically 17 years between the time something new was discovered and when it was broadly accepted and implemented. And, and we have reduced, the, so my argument was, we need to compress transformational time from decades down to days and weeks. And I can, I can assure you, we have effectively done that already. There are many, many practices that we have implemented within days or weeks now of new scientific evidence published either outside our organization or, or with it, within it. Um, so what you, the, the quality improvement cycle is basically measure what you do, practice-based evidence. So that's just the clinical practice, clinical processes, 
personal preferences of the person, aka patient, consumer, member, um, and um, then doing the analytics and predictive analytics, looking at clinical ad outcomes, satisfaction outcomes, functional outcomes, time off work, the employers are very concerned about end-to-end -end costs, um, and looking for positive deviance. So, you know, the, the notion of hotspotting, looking for where is somebody achieving better outcomes and how do we understand how they did that and incorporate it. And then changing your decision support for care processes, care practices, decision support, the question earlier, shared decision making, looking at the multi-omics, I'm going to get into some detail on that. And we have many examples of how um, with uh, Vioxx, when, when we discovered that it was, um, uh, had unknown severe um, cerebrovascular, cardiovascular uh, impacts, we took it off of our formulary like overnight, stopped its use. It, it took uh, months for anyone else to do that. Uh, I'm going to give one more example of how we compressed the learning cycle. I read um, an online article from the New England Journal of Medicine about how half of all patients who have their spleen removed are not adequately vaccinated for pneumococcus. And this is a widely available vaccine. And the reason that 50% that are not appropriately treated is because most splenectomies occur as a result of trauma, which is typically a motor vehicle accident, which typically takes you in an ambulance to St. Elsewhere. And so where your spleen is taken out, you're generally unconscious. And when you come back to see your primary care doctor, the records are this thick from your uh, three-week ICU stay. You don't remember. You, you don't even know why you've got a scar there other than something was bleeding. And so your vaccine is, is not given appropriately or the revaccination five years later. So I read the article, this is like three years ago. I called my natural language processing team. I have 20 uh, MD, PhD types in Del Mar who do natural language processing, data mining of our entire uh, health record system. And I said, go through the 20 million records we have and tell me how many um, have had their spleen taken out and how many of those remain to be vaccinated appropriately. And so it took them a couple of hours to construct the query. It took them three hours um, of, of number of crunching to go through all the texts and all of our medical records to find uh, that cohort. And they're now all vaccinated. So all of these people that we discovered who had had their spleen taken out um, but who hadn't had the vaccination are now vaccinated. And what I will tell you, the reason I bring up natural language processing is because we did not have coded diagnoses of splenectomy in the chart. Uh, I asked my data miners who use coded data to do the same query, and it fell far short of what we found uh, by data mining free text. So there are a lot of opportunities um, to shorten and, and compress this transformational learning cycle, and that's what we've been doing with the health record. A couple of uh, quick quotes. Samuel Arbison wrote a book called The Half-Life of Facts, Why Everything We Know Has an Expiration Date. And John Ioannidis, a, a professor uh, at Stanford, has uh, extensively studied the medical literature and shown that 41% of all published medical literature is subsequently refuted. And that's only, that's only the stuff that someone bothered to refute, okay? Because so much of it is obviously absurd that nobody even bothers to refute it. So it's well over 50% of what's published is garbage. So it's very difficult for me um, to read medical journal articles anymore because I know the prospects of it being valid um, and, and of persistent value are relatively low. Um, so what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a uh, you know, couple, of, couple of comments, a couple of questions sort of mixed in together. So Andy Gross, founder of Intel, and Vinod Kosa, co-founder of Sun Microsystems, have both said that 80% of all doctors are going to go away because so much of what happens in the uh, office and the hospital day is unnecessary. And when independent and other uh, similar groups are fully implemented uh, pervasively, <coughs> excuse me, we will be able to uh, reduce the demand in healthcare. I actually think we'll redeploy resources um, rather than replace 80% of doctors, and hopefully we can return to uh, the business of caring for patients rather than uh, treating disease, um, caring for people. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the American Academy of uh, Medical uh, Colleges has said we need to produce 30% more doctors very quickly because this, this, if you will, pig in a python of the dis dis disorders of lifestyle 
of obesity, sedentary lifestyle, poor eating habits, poor sleeping habits, consequently obesity, diabetes, stroke, heart attack, cancer. And I, I mention those things not because they're common causes of death, but because they are unequivocally, scientifically linked to disorders of lifestyle. Um, many forms of cancer, uh, Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia are also linked to sedentary lifestyle and obesity. So um, we have um, two pioneers in technology saying we need 80% less doctors and we have a, a movement to increase the output of doctors by 30%. So we're on a collision course. Well, fortunately, the collision is not going to happen for quite a while um, from the standpoint of uh, load balancing of supply and demand. Unfortunately, the reason for that is we have this pig and a python of all these disorders of lifestyle that we're finally beginning to turn the corner on. So we're actually having an impact right now in reducing childhood obesity. The, the U.S. has begun to turn the corner. Unfortunately for the rest of the world, the globalization of all of our fast food chains um, it has these epidemics still growing everywhere else in the world, uh, but the U.S. where we've just begun to turn the corner. Um, so let me ask a question. How many of you um, uh, have ever worn a pedometer, Fitbit, or any sort of sensor? Just show of hands. Okay, so most of you. How many have one on today? Okay, so less than half. Um, and I'm going to come back to that and make a comment about why that is, um, that only half uh, of us still wear one. Um, how many practice some form of meditation or yoga? Okay. Those four of you are going to live longer than the rest of us in the audience, uh, just FYI. The, the, the scientific evidence for that is overwhelming. We know that people who uh, meditate and do yoga live longer. And right now, Deepak Chopra is working with Eric Schott um, at uh, Mount Sinai in New York, doing big data analytics of all the omics and actually explicating and elucidating the molecular mechanisms of how that occurs. We know it happens. We can see the correlation, and what they're doing is, is they're studying the causative pathway between that correlation um, as we speak, and that, that research is going to be profoundly influential. And those of you that haven't seen it, the most recent Scientific American Medicine uh, issue is devoted to the health benefits of the meditative um, arts. Um, so how many have used Uber, the cab service? Okay, so I've used it like four times in the last 24 hours. Um, and how many have used Airbnb to stay? Okay, just two folks. Okay, if you haven't used Airbnb, it's, it's awesome. Uh, the reason I, I ask about those two is because they operate on a very direct principle of reciprocal transparency. And let me just ask those of you that have used Uber, does anybody know their Uber score, their personal Uber score? Anybody? Okay. Well, actually, they score you too. And so next time you get a, a ride from Uber, ask them what your score is. Um, because if they picked you up at a bar at 3 a.m. and um, you've um, made a mess of their back seat um, on the way home, um, you're not going to have a very good Uber score. And I was telling somebody this once, and they said, how, how come it is that every time I'm standing with a group of people and we're going for Uber, they always get one before I do? And I said, well, um, remember that 3 a.m. Uh, trip you had? Um, so, and the same thing is true of Airbnb. So you rate... Uh, the services you get in somebody else's home or flat or apartment, and they rate you as a rentor. And so this kind of reciprocal transparency is something that's going to become very, very critical as we get more and more and more into the world of big data. We're already way in there. And, you know, Edward Snowden uh, blew the whistle, and while he's a colorful character, the one thing that, that I completely agree with him on is we need to have watchers who watch the watchers who watch the watchers. Um, and this, this, inter, this, this element of transparency becomes very, very important. So has anybody heard of Open Notes? It's a new movement in healthcare. So Open Notes was pioneered about five years ago at Harvard by a, a professor of internal medicine by the name of Tom DeBanco, just one of the greatest people I've ever met. And what happens there is when your doctor signs your electronic note and sends it to her chart, it immediately and simultaneously goes to your chart, so that you have full access to your complete health record, not just your upcoming visits and your lab results and your x-ray results and so forth. So um, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center um, is where Tom DeMonco started this movement, and he got funding from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And um, our Northwest region um, is about 90% of their docs currently use it, so 90% of all notes are sent out to our members 
um, simultaneous to it going to the chart. Um, so again, this is about this, this transparency, having the person, consumer, patient, member have transparency into what we're thinking. And so doctors fight this uh, very vigorously. So I tried to get our Southern California region to do the same thing. Um, we're the largest region in the Kaiser program. Um, and I've uh, met the same resistance everybody else met, and I've addressed it the same way everybody else has addressed it. But there are enough squeaky wheels who have said, oh, the patients are going to sue me. They're going to email me and call me, and it's going to generate all this extra work, and, they won't, and I'll have to change how I write my note. And the truth of the matter is, when, when other doctors have done this around the world, um, basically, there's no need to change notes because every person has access to the Internet. So when they look at their chart and see that you mentioned SOB, um, in the chart note, um, and they're worried that you're calling them an SOB, they can Google SOB and find out that it means shortness of breath, um, not the, the common parlance. And so what happens from that is that there's some people who might be inclined to call because they see, they see something they didn't understand, but more often than not, they have a better understanding of what you were talking about in your medical jargon and are become more participatory and engaged. Uh, in their healthcare. Um, I mentioned Singularity University um, and exponential medicine. As, if, if any of you are interested, it's, it's, the, it's my favorite conference of the year. It's, they're concentrated courses. They're four days, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. of intensive uh, talks about all of the new science uh, and technology in healthcare. Um, has anybody read the book Connected by any chance? So, two people. Okay. So, um, two professors at Harvard, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler, um, wrote this book about the influence of social networks on health, and they studied the original Framingham data from um, Massachusetts. This is before Facebook or Friendster or MySpace um, or any of the social networks. And the, and the Framingham study actually does include all of the social network information about who you're connected to. And what they showed is that the, the influence of your social network is profound on your health. So if the people you hang out with in your neighborhood or at work are sedentary and obese, you are overwhelmingly likely to be sedentary and obese. If you move or change jobs to a neighborhood or a employer where people are into fitness and walking at lunch, and standing instead of sitting all day long, so, so sitting is the new smoking, um, that you're, you are very, very likely to lose weight. And so they've actually animated some of these effects uh, online, and I encourage you to look at it. So I saw James Fowler on um, Where Every Good Scientist um, Does Their Homework on the Stephen Colbert Show, um, and um, he, he's an amazing guy. He moved from Harvard. He's here a professor at UC San Diego. And I said, you know, your book is, I read his book, I said, your book is amazing, I want to work with you, so we're doing some work together analyzing what's called social exhaust, the data coming out of Facebook with the consent of our members, and looking for validating biomarkers like influenza-like illness and immunization status and smoking status, and then carpeting social networks, not individuals, not members, but social networks um, with uh, healthy messages to address what we find uh, about their pattern of biomarkers. And we're just beginning this work now, so we haven't done the outbound yet. We're just um, beginning to enroll um, uh, people into the study. And I said, but now what's the, what's the next big thing you're working on? And he says, I'm going to look at the genetics of social networks. I said, wow, that's interesting. And so last June, he published his results. Looking, he got consent. He got Facebook streams. And he's a brilliant statistician sociologist, and Nicholas Christakis is a brilliant physician. And, and they represent, like, six or seven of the different components of the healthcare pleco system that I mentioned earlier um, in their own brains. And so they've shown that on average, your social network, a member of your social network is as closely related to you genetically. They looked at 1.2 million markers, genetic markers, as closely related to you as your fourth cousin. They were blown away. They expected to find a correlation, but they were blown away. It's like you share a great-great-grandfather in common. And so it turns out, not only can you not choose your family, but it appears that you have more, uh, less influence over choosing your friends than you thought. And a lot of it's fascinating. A lot of this has to do with the sense of smell. Um, a lot of the markers uh, where the similarities are seen in the sense of smell. So an unrelated study has shown that you can actually, with 80% accuracy, look at the genetics of smell and predict whether someone is a Republican or a Democrat. So that's just a, 
interesting factor. Not how they smell, but, but their sense of smell. <laughs> okay. Um, so has anybody heard of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health? Okay. So uh, David Altshuler, who's uh, one of the leading geneticists in the world, comes out of George Church's group at Harvard and uh, has his office at the Broad Institute at MIT. Um, uh, he and I uh, were subject matter experts for uh, a Jason report that was published here um, uh, about a year and a half ago. And he invited me to join this, and I now co-lead the, the eHealth work group of genomics and phenomics um, in healthcare. And so why would I choose to spend time working with a bunch of folks, uh, genetic consortiums from around the world, on genomics? And it comes back to some of the earlier dialogue about interoperability. Turns out that, first of all, there's no such thing as a common disease. There is no such thing as a common disease when you begin looking at genomics and all of the other omics. Um, and Eric Schott of Mount Sinai has already shown there's at least seven types of type 2 diabetes. And if you look at breast cancer, there's this huge variation across individuals and within an individual cancer, there's polyclonality so that you see differences of different clones. And until we begin to address that, we're not really understanding how to best approach cancer. So it turns out that if given that there's no such thing as a common disease and I want to have a sufficient cohort of people to study anything about um, a disease that we can now characterize in very, very detailed fashion, um, I may only have 20 patients in my cohort of 20 million at Kaiser Permanente um, and to study. And so we need to be able to ask the following question of these consortiums from around the world. So we have almost every major consortium from China to Australia, throughout the EU, um, Singapore, Japan, all part of the consortium, and they're all represented on my work group. And if we want to ask the question, do you have any patients that have these phenotypic expressions associated with these genotypic sequences? The answer is there is no, there is no syntax, there is no semantic for asking that question. Mind-blowing. When David told me this two years ago, I said, you've got to be kidding. And he said, no, really, it doesn't exist. So we're in the business of creating that syntax, of asking the question, how many people do you have with this phenome and this genome and this association, so that we can then create the studies and create truly personalized medicine um, based upon those studies. So um, that's really important. Um, last question, how many of you have heard of the Gartner hype cycle? Anybody? Okay, so three or four folks. So I'm going to show, Gar Gartner is uh, uh, this group that um, sort of looks at the, the life cycle of technology. And someone asked the question earlier, you know, is, is this really going to get traction? Is it really going to go anywhere? And, and so mobile healthcare has been subject to that question, as is every new technology. Um, and so Gartner publishes what they call a hype cycle, and then they map different technologies along that. So because they charge for this, um, I can only use an outdated one. So we subscribe and we get all the current ones. Um, but um, I can use an old one and then I do an overlay of some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. So this is the Gartner hype cycle. This is actually all the, the black print below um, is their stuff. And then I've added the big red bolds. But so there's a, there, in, the, in the life cycle of a technology, whether it's in the, so this is when Richard has his epiphany about Independa is the technology trigger, okay? And then there's a peak of inflated expectations about this is going to cure everything. And then there's the trough of disillusionment. And then there's a slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. And so if you, they map out each year um, where various things are on this curve. And so some of the things that I'm working on, I'm working on a lot of these things, but I'm just going to really speak in more detail. I'm not going to speak about the electronic health record any further because um, that's really old news. I completed that project six, six years ago. Um, pervasive sensing, genomics, big data, fast data, and I'll weave in some of the other things. But fast data, how many have heard the term fast data? It's a very new term. Okay. So one of you has. Um, and, and basically, fast data is about how um, in the world of gathering massive amounts of data about billions of people, we can identify patterns that are of immediate value. So, for example, retailers are really interested as you walk into their store and they use facial, this gets creepy, but it's real. That's why we need the diadarity, not the singularity. Um, as you walk in the store and they recognize who you are, 
They go and search what they, everything they know about you and your purchasing habits, and you get a text and your phone um, beeps with a text saying, hey, did you know that we have this on sale today because we know you're interested in this? So that's the kind of fast data analytics that are emerging, and one of the pioneers of database technology out of MIT um, has created the term fast data and has created a database architecture that actually addresses um, the optimization of databases for how we can look at massive amounts of data processing quickly and instantaneously uh, have an output. So that's the newest thing, and it's just, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised anybody here had heard of it because the, the term is only a couple months old. Big data, everybody's heard of. A um, lot of hype, and I'll come back to that in detail. Genomics, um, and, you know, San Diego's the hotbed of genomics in the world with um, <coughs> Craig Venter and the Bender Institute and Larry Smarr and microbiomics and Illumina and Sequinome and, and I mean, this, the Sereno Mesa is, is really, uh, there's a lot happening here. Uh, pervasive sensing, um, and I love what you said about not using the term monitoring. Um, it, sensing could be uh, pejoratized in the same way, but really having a dialogue is more important. But pervasive sensing is uh, inter interesting because some of the commentary about the Computer Electronics Show this year in Las Vegas that just ended is that there were more big announcements in the healthcare space last year than there were this year. Um, but yet, the market cap of all of the uh, startups in the space is just exploding. It, it's on the exponential part of the, the sigmoid curve. Um, and so anyhow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover these in a little bit more detail. But first, a couple of sort of um, quotes that, that really elaborate on what the Gartner Hype Cycle is about. So Roy Amara, who was president of the Institute for the Future, once said, futures tend to overestimate the near-term impact of technology and underestimate the long-term impact. And this pattern is so true, and I'll take genomics as an example. So when Watson and Crick discovered what they did, and Craig Venter spent $2 billion sequencing his own genome, and everybody said, oh, you know, next year we're going to solve all of the mysteries of, of healthcare. Well, uh, it's been a long time coming, but we are now finally getting, so there, were, there was this hype early on, and then this trough of disillusionment, but now we're seeing some tremendous um, uh, explosions of um, uh, output in this space, and I'll come back to some of those. Uh, Paul Sappho, uh, well-known futurist at Stanford, um, sort of echoed what a lot of mountaineers have said for many years, and that is, never mistake a clear vision for a short distance. And I wish I had seen that quote about 20 years ago, because that has been the frustration of my life. Um, of mistaking a clear vision for a short distance, always hoping and expecting things to happen sooner than they do. William Gibson, the sci-fi writer, famously wrote in The Economist in 2002, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. So some of what I'm going to talk about uh, this morning um, is mind-blowing sci-fi, um, but it's already, um, it's already here, it's, it's just not uh, pervasive. And then um, I've made a couple of uh, predictions. The first is that 90% of all new knowledge in health and medicine will be generated by research in silico by 2020, meaning doing the analytics on big data, not doing prospective uh, double-blind crossover randomized controlled trials. Those will not go away because they have an important role, but 90% of new knowledge uh, will be generated in 2020. Turns out that prediction was wrong. Um, it's clear, it's increasingly clear that it's going to be much sooner than 2020 when we hit the 90% mark on that. And then the future of innovation belongs to collaborators. Um, and uh, hence, soon high uh, this conference um, and the need to collaborate. So I'm going to give a couple of illustrations about how cross-disciplinary fertilization is where the future of innovation is. Um, does anybody recognize this painting by um, uh, Kazimir Malevich? Um, so this is hanging in MoMA in New York, and my wife and I saw it about 10, 12 years ago and looked at it, and we laughed and said, they call that art? Well. The name of this portrait is called Boy with a Knapsack. And the context of this painting in 1915 was that Picasso had just said, you know, abstract art can only go so far because there has to be a thread of connection between art and reality. And Casimir said, baloney. Um, this is a boy with a knapsack. You show me the thread, you know. This is basically a challenge to Pablo Picasso. Um, and the notion of abstraction. 
and, and he liberated abstract art to go well beyond this constraint that Picasso had very vociferously put on the field of art. But what's relevant about that um, is this. So there's a, there's a book called Inventing Abstraction. It's a fabulous book. And it's almost, it, it refers to the period 100 years ago from today, so, that, so there's this periodicity that's very interesting. Um, this is the social graph. This is the kind of thing that James Fowler Nicholas Kerstak has documented in the Framingham study and the influence of social networks on health. But these red spots are the Pablo Picassos and the Claude Debussy's and the poets, musicians, and artists in Europe around the 1910 and 1915 when abstraction was being invented. And these people, this social graph was constructed based upon meetings and letters and correspondence and interaction between poets, musicians, and artists that really led to abstraction across all of those um, arts. And it really does reflect the criticality of collaboration across discipline. So what's that got to do with anything in healthcare. It's got everything to do with healthcare in Sunhai. Um, it is, um, what, what, is, what, is, what is big data really about? So big, most people, so recently a study was published, 40 different experts in big data gave their own definition of what big data was. And I read them and there were two or three that I thought made some sense, the rest of them were nonsense. Um, big data is fundamentally different. Turns out that, that uh, Cecil Cutting was one of the founding physicians. Did you ever meet Cecil, Richard? Okay, Cecil Cutting was one of the founding physicians in Kaiser Permanente, and I gave a talk at, at one of the big data analytics um, um, uh, conferences, and this guy who's six foot eight, um, in a, it was in Silicon Valley, so of course he had his tennis shoes and t-shirt on, and he comes walking up to me in, uh, backstage, and he says, I love what you had to say, and I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Doug Cutting. I'm Cecil Cutting's nephew, and I thought, oh my God, that's awesome, because I never met Cecil Cutting either. He's one of the real geniuses of Kaiser Permanente and integrated healthcare. And, and, and I, I did a, um, a, a bow in, in respect for his um, family lineage, and, and I said, oh, so what, what do you do in big data? And he says, well, I'm the founder of Hadoop. Well, Hadoop is the central transformational view of what what big data is about. So let me tell you what big data is really about. You can, don't read those 40 other um, definitions given by experts in big data. Um, what big data is about is what Doug Cutting invented with Hadoop. And that is, rather than the conventional way of taking a lexicon of terms um, and concepts and putting them into a taxonomy and then creating canonical definitions of the relationship between any of those two terms or three terms and putting that into a database schema and then cramming data into pigeonholes in the database that canonify the relationship of those data types with other data types. That's what traditional relational databases do. And all the data mining done before uh, Doug Cutting uh, invented Hadoop um, were based upon these canonical relationships, okay? So that's great if we really understand everything we're trying to study already. There's, the, there's an oxymoron in there. Um, and so uh, one of my favorite tweets uh, was ontology is a one word oxymoron because it presumes that we already know the relationships between all the unique concepts. What big data does is says, no, 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 no. Let's not get preoccupied with defining the right way to represent relationships between data. Let's just take every atomic level data piece we can get. Let's gather all the atomic metadata associated with that data point. Let's assemble it into one location. And then we can ask any question we want and not be constrained by these preordained canonical relationships between different concepts. So this is a radical departure from data representations of the past. And it liberates us to do exactly what Sunhai is about, is take information from totally different disciplines and not presume how they're related, but just throw them together in what's appropriately called a data lake or a landing zone. And then we can start looking for relationships um, in those data. So big data is a big change. Um, and uh, most people who talk about it really don't understand that fundamental distinction. So um, I've been trying to simplify uh, how we think about what's happening with big data. And I finally found the metaphor, and it's what I call the inverted Big Bang. So we all know that 14 billion years ago, the Big Bang took all 
everything that exists in the universe in a, in a point in space and time, and there's this huge explosion, and from that point forward, there has been an accelerating um, diffusion of matter and energy across all of space and time. So when, and this is an um, image of um, the um, Big Bang and how all um, matter and energy has been diffused over the universe at an, at an accelerating rate. What big data is doing is it's taking all of the data and knowledge and information we can gather and converging it at an accelerating rate into a point in space and time. So we can now ask questions of a landing zone that we could never ask before. And, and, and the rate of growth of data that is ending up in these landing zones is growing at an exponential rate, only restrained by privacy and security kind of concerns. Big constraint, but we're working on it. So this is, this is my metaphor for what big data is. It's the inversion of the Big Bang and bringing all this stuff together. So the other thing is, um, and, and what Sunhai is about, and uh, what I enjoy the most is bringing brains from different disciplines and really having dialogues like they did with the creation of abstraction a century ago. Um, and so I was looking for a metaphor for that. And if you think about it, a tropical rainforest um, is a really, really interesting thing because it takes very limited resources. So as, as you know, in the, in the Amazon, when they slash and burn, they get one crop and then they've exhausted all the nutrients and they have to move on. So there's very, very limited resources. But yet, one of the richest, most diverse ecosystems in the world is the tropical rainforest that thrives on almost no resources. And it maximizes the incoming energy, sunlight, into creating a very biodiverse, very um, rich ecosystem. So um, this is a tropical rainforest. And so it reminded me of what we need to do with all these data coming from different sources. And it's what I call a metatopical brain forest. So bringing people together from different disciplines to operate on data from everywhere um, in a, in a very um, inexpensive, resource-poor environment. So it turns out that doing a query on exabytes of data is increasingly cheap. This, this, because of Moore's Law, uh, you don't need a lot of resources to do this. You can rent a massive amount of storage and computational power on Amazon or any of the cloud providers today for nothing, for a pittance. Um, so the cloud, the cloud has gone through the hype cycle as well, but the cloud is very real. So what are some of our early experiences? I mentioned the uh, splenectomy and pneumococcal vaccine. Um, we uh, have a much better understanding of what um, diseases people suffer from, from mining these data. Um, we now have, have uh, been able to detect sepsis, a bacterial infection of the bloodstream in, in inpatients in our hospitals, and give antibiotics earlier. Why does that matter? It means everything to the survival of that person, how quickly and early we can diagnose that they have um, an infection. And um, so we've, we've gotten very good at that. But we have many, many studies underway linking the genomics, the microbiomics, and all of these different data types to be able to do that. So there's a lot of risks of doing this too. So um, the first risk is ignoring the obvious. So if you look at a correlation that is obviously just spurious, um, you need to have some deep subject matter experts say, no, 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 that's, that's simply not possible, um, and that it's just a spurious finding. Um, second one is around privacy and unauthorized uh, re-identification. So the notion of anonymizing data and de-identified data, get over it. That's, that's a, um, a historical legacy that is not even remotely possible anymore. Uh, Daniel Soloff, um, a brilliant writer on security, has written a textbook, and in that he describes how easy it is to re-identify people through aggregation of data. And in fact, it's been shown that the first, you know, the first thousand genomes that were de-identified and put on the web for researchers to use around the world, 670 of those people have been re-identified accurately to the person, okay? Just from the minimal meta metadata. So um, that's a problem. The, second, the third is inferring causality. So you see a correlation and you say, that's cool, but is it really related? Is it causal? There's a whole emerging science of, of statistics around how you go from a statistical correlation to um, a causative relationship um, by doing what's called data interrogation. And I won't go into detail, but there's a lot of different ways you can validate a finding uh, through different approaches and power analyses and so forth. The fourth issue is consent. Um, and so people are working on what are called micro-consent metadata so that when you give your data to science, so I'm one of the most quantified people 
in the world because I uh, volunteered to be a subject in the chair of genetics at Stanford's uh, what's called the uh, IPOP, intrapersonal omics profile study, um, where I have four of my, 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 I've had my complete genome sequenced. I have four microbiomes completely sequenced every three months and thousands of blood assays every three months. And whenever I get sick, I have to show up um, in Mike Snyder's lab at Stanford. Um, and so um, consent to what can be done with my data becomes very important. Um, and how we manage that in the big data world. Uh, invalid misinterpretations, um, it's really easy. Anybody who's done data analytics knows that someone who doesn't understand the context of which the data was acquired, how it can be misinterpreted. And so I uh, propose this notion of data concierges where no study can be done on any subset of data within our data lake unless someone who was close to where the data was gathered, the source data, uh, participates in the study itself. And then finally, uh, data integrity, um, so provenance metadata. So where was the data created? How many hops has there been along the course from when it was created to when you put it into the data lake? So now I'm going to speak about uh, the Pleco system, which is the multi-platform ecosystem, um, and all the components that are radically transforming our opportunity to understand health and wellness. So the internet and cloud um, have basically uh, provided connectivity from anywhere to anywhere in the world. So the, the purpose of this Global Alliance for Genomics and Health is to be able to link um, from around the entire world um, uh, data sets around this phenotype or disease is associated with this genotype um, as one example. The smartphone with video dial tone so you can Skype your grandchildren uh, anywhere in the world um, with, uh, with ease. Uh, we're implementing that in, in uh, Kaiser Permanente right now so that any two, three, four, or five people can have a, uh, a discussion uh, real time uh, where you can see the facial expressions. So where this is really interesting, for example, is end-of-life care. And uh, so I practiced critical care medicine and ran an ICU um, for years. And one of the things that I treasured most about my privilege of, of being a practicing physician is at the end of life, um, not telling the mother, the sister, the father, the daughter of a dying unconscious patient, what ought to be done for them, but trying to elucidate what would they have wanted, what, was, what, was, what were their wishes about end of life care? Would they want the plug pulled now? Would they want to have intravenous feeding or not under these circumstances with these probabilities? So being able to have a conversation with the relevant family members, the primary care doc, the cardiologist, the pulmonologist, all in one moment in time, linked uh, by video, is going to have a, a profound benefit for having these kind of discussions. So eliminating distance as a problem for having these very critical discussions. Um, the social home, I mentioned the work I'm doing with James Fowler on looking at, at digital data harvested for health and wellness. The quantified self, I'm going to go into much uh, greater detail in a bit. Um, the exposome. So San Diego, it turns out, has the biggest sensor, the densest sensor network in the world of both fixed and mobile sensors for envi environmental um, things like pollutants and allerg uh, uh, allergens, pollens, and so forth. So um, we're launching a study with some folks at UCSD, um, the founder of the, the uh, academic journal Preventive Medicine, um, who's doing this work, um, looking at the sensing data of the environmental contaminants vis-a-vis -vis the flares of reactive lung disease in our members so that we can actually do correlations and figure out, well, you know, you should avoid uh, going out today because what you are pers personalized medicine, what you are personally reacting to is at a very high value in the vicinity of your house today or your work or whatever. Um, the um, sixth member of this PLECO system is the inexpensive genome. So it's not just the genome, but the microbiome, transcriptome, lipidome, proteome, metabolome. I'm going to come back to some of these because um, we're on the Serena Mesa where a lot of this work is being pioneered. And the associated stem cell therapy, um, Bob Hariri, who's founder and CEO of uh, Cell Gene, also teaches at, at uh, Singularity every year and is, is uh, the leading um, uh, can't call it a startup anymore with a valuation of $50 billion, but Celgene um, is doing stem cell therapy and achieving amazing results where you take the stem cells out of an individual with a genetic disorder, um, fix the genetic defect in those stem cells using what's called CRISPR, which is this very large molecular complex 
which works just like a database editor. So there's four things you can do in a database. Um, you can create, you can revise, you can update, you can delete data. So CRISPR is this massive molecular complex that goes down your DNA sequence and can create, revise, update, and delete. And so we're learning how to manipulate that in stem cells, fix things, and then put those stem cells back into the individual affected by the disorder and basically curing their diseases. Um, so what Celgene and Bob Herrera are doing is just mind-blowing. Um, and the publication cycle is way behind what he's doing, uh, just the nature of research, um, but some phenomenal stuff happening there. And there are now nanobots that we can inject into people to monitor for 12 different types of cancer. Soon it will be hundreds, soon it will be thousands. And the first trial of using a therapeutic nanobot is going to start in Israel uh, within a month or two, uh, where they've, there's this, this really cool methodology of creating three-dimensional matrices of DNA and it's like a, a mouse trap, like a, a Venus mouse trap, um, fly trap type of, of nanobot using DNA that is programmed for specific DNA markers in leukemia. And so that trial is about to begin um, in another month or two in Israel to actually not just detect the abnormal cells, but actually to kill them using DNA recognition mechanisms and nanobots. Um, electronic health record data, I mentioned we have massive amounts of that. Predictive analytics, machine learning, deep learning. Persuasive technology, so getting back to the human side of things, um, information therapy is a bust. So information therapy was a big rage 10 years ago. You tell people, well, here's what you do to be healthy and everybody gets well, right? Well, that's why McDonald's went out of business, right? Because everybody knows it's unhealthy to eat junk food. Unfortunately, information is insufficient. Um, we need to understand how to motivate people using these technologies. And social networks are one of the important technologies for motivating people. Independa is working on a lot of this. Um, uh, brilliantly. And then finally, I just put in a laundry list of other things. Avatars, AI robotics, uh, heads-up displays, 3D printing, ultra haptics, all of which are intended to broker the relationship between each one of us and uh, the physical world. So it's a digital broker between humans uh, and the world, and all of those things are relevant. Um, people hear the word avatar and they think of the movie. Well, um, we already have many um, digital assistance, whether it's recommendations for what we read on Amazon or what we buy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Google, what, what Google knows about us, but um, we know that the human brain is wired um, to respond to social cues better than anything else. So how we leverage that genetic heritage we have in the way our brain is connected, and there's a whole discipline called the connectome, um, how we manage that um, is uh, very important. And then finally, the question, I gave a keynote about five years ago called, Who Owns Your Avatar and Why Do You Care? And it was all about the notion of watching the watchers who are watching the watchers, because we will all have many avatars very soon. We're using avatars. We have a, an avatar project where we're taking people who are um, scheduled to have um, uh, bypass surgery for morbid obesity, and in order to qualify for surgery, they have to lose 10% of the weight before surgery to show that they have the psychological wherewithal to really benefit from the surgery. And so what we do is we take avatars say, here's what you're going to look and feel like when the surgery is complete and you stick with the program to help motivate them to lose that 10% of their weight. We're getting phenomenal results. And there, um, as I mentioned, I mentor a lot of startups. There's a lot of startups using avatars um, to help motivate people to do their physical therapy using, you know, the Connect uh, technology and, and um, related technologies. So as we begin to anthropomorphize and socialize the inputs and create these avatars, we are going to willingly, we already do, willingly give data so that we get something, a service in return. And as we are incentivized to give more and more data, we need to be a little more cognizant and have a little more transparency into who has my data and what else they're doing with it. So they are, are they using it just to help me be healthier? Or are they using it to tip me from a Democratic side to a Republican side if I'm independent? Um, are they trying to get me to change my religious affiliation? What, what are the subliminal messages that are coming through these avatars? It's going to be very, very critical um, how we manage this, again, in that dyadarity between the human side of values and objectives and the technology. So I want to introduce another concept. Uh, my daughter uh, was studying meiosis in biology, and she came to me 
I said, Dad, I just don't get meiosis. What, what is meiosis? And I hearkened back to my um, high school, and I thought, wow, that, that was really tough to sort of wrap your mind around what meiosis is and pass the test. And so, like any good dad, I went to YouTube. Um, and I found a whole series of videos on meiosis and YouTube, and I'm not going to take the time to show them, um, but it's really, really simple what happens. So I'm going to use this slide to illustrate it. And, and this is the ultimate innovation machine, and it does reflect the Pleco system and exchange of ideas. So imagine every gene is an idea, okay, because they are. And we have 30,000 genes that code for proteins, and we have tens of thousands of other genes that we're not sure what they do yet. And we have meta-regulators, meta-genes um, like CRISPR um, that are all involved in our survival and our adaptability and our evolution. But what meiosis does as an innovation engine is it deliberately generates diversity. So, we'll, so imagine this. The first act of meiosis is you take the, the paternal and the maternal chromatid, one from your father, one from your mother. You bring them together, you link them to the kinetic core. And then you do this massive swap of ideas, genes, between the two. It's called crossover. Okay, so that's pretty crazy. So you've got, you've got these two chromosomes that work, right? And you're saying, that's not good enough. We're going we're gonna to do a mashup of all these ideas and genes. Um, and then seconds later, you do random assortment. And you take uh, chromosomes 1, 5, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16 from your mom, and you take the rest from your dad. And you put them into a haplotype, a sperm or an egg. So you've done a second random assortment, mashup of ideas. Um, and then the third act of meiosis um, is the ultimate uh, phase, and that is you bring the two haplotypes, the egg and the sperm, together, and you create yet a third mashup of ideas. So meiosis, in a matter of minutes or hours or days, has three massive mashups of ideas, which is extraordinary. So that's what we... That's, that's what Sunhai is trying to create. That's what, um, this, what I'm trying to do with the healthcare Pleco system is to bring this stuff together to create the exponential synergies that are possible by generating diversity of thought, diversity of ideas from diverse sources of information. So what are some of the implications of uh, panoramics? Um, and panoramics is a term, there's, there's many other terms, exomics and so forth, for the, the genome, the transcriptome, which is how we go from DNA to RNA, um, and the RNA associated with it, and then the translation into proteins, the proteome and the lipidome, and, and so forth. And these are each one very complicated. But how do, we, how do we look at personalized medicine with all of these different data sets, and how do we convert that um, into um, health and wellness? So genomics is basically going to be incredibly valuable to identify um, which of us in the audience needs to be screened for prostate cancer every six months or have a nanobot inserted to monitor for it because we're such high genetic risk, and which of us never needed to be tested because we have no risk at all based upon our genome, um, and likewise for breast cancer. So it's going to sort of give us a pattern of risk to know what to look for. And the current study from Johns Hopkins that was published last week, notwithstanding, where it says two-thirds of all cancers, how many people saw that study? Two-thirds of all cancers are bad luck, only a third are related to genes or environment? Well, first thing, let me just say, caveat emptor on that one, because what they did is they looked at the cell division rate in different organ systems, and they mapped the incidence and prevalence of cancer vis-a-vis -vis the turnover rate, and they said, for two-thirds of all cancers, it's simply a derivative of how rapidly those tissues are multiplying, and so, ergo, it's bad luck, random chance, right? I don't accept that premise yet, and I have some ways that I'm going to propose to them to test an alternative hypothesis, because not everybody gets cancer in every organ system that's at risk. So there are bound to be some things within that bad luck that predispose us. So as we begin to unveil that, we're going to learn more and more. So pharmacogenomics, there are a number of vendors who sell systems today that look at your cytochrome enzymes that metabolize drugs and say, this is both the safest and the most effective drug for you among, within class, so within the statins or within the beta blockers. This is the one for you. Um, and this is the dose for you. So we now have a way of predicting benefits, side effects, and dosing based upon pharmacogenomics. Um, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics are going to derive prescribing and monitoring of early benefits and risks. So, we don't need to wait five weeks to get another hemoglobin A1C to look at how well you're doing with your diabetes. 
when we can look at much shorter term proxies, uh, metabolic indicators of how well you're doing. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to have a, a lot coming in the diagnostic space to help monitor what we have presumed is the best therapy for you based upon your personalized medicine omics profile. Um, the fourth one is point of care testing. Uh, uh, Kerry Mullins, who invented polymerase chain reaction um, and who uh, used to um, be a professor and work here on the, uh, the Sorrento Mesa and who I've been out surfing with, um, in, in La Jolla uh, before um, he aged out of surfing and moved up to uh, Los Angeles area. Um, there is now a device that is a point of care testing device that does PCR on the spot. So it's already been built out for Ebola and the FDA is getting an emergency use authorization to use this tool to diagnose Ebola many days, if not a week before the first fever symptom of Ebola from a drop of blood to detect Ebola in your bloodstream. So if someone's getting on a plane in Nigeria to fly to the US, I can guarantee you that within six months um, they will be required to have this blood test to show that there's not Ebola in their bloodstream. Um, and it's awaiting the FDA approval to do that. And I, I was actually fortunate to be one of the, uh, I'm, a, I'm a consultant to the X Prize, and so I help give the award to Anita Goel, who's the founder of the company um, who creates this point of care testing device. But before this, that was a year and a half ago before the Ebola crisis emerged. And so she said, what, what would Kaiser want to do this? And I said, I, I said, I know what exactly what I want to do with it. The H7N9 flu virus that's in Hong Kong and China right now, 40% mortality rate. And it's been estimated that it's between one and three mutations away from becoming highly contagious and potentially an epidemic like the 1917 flu epidemic um, with a very high mortality rate with tens of millions uh, of people dying. So I said, I want to be able to put your device everywhere, everywhere. And when someone has upper respiratory symptoms and we know H7N9 has had that next mutation so that it's more infectious and contagious, that we can identify those people immediately and isolate them rather than what we do today is say, come on everybody with a cough and a sneeze, come into our waiting rooms and cough and sneeze all over each other so that you can share, right? Um, that's the way it works today. And we need to be able to put these out initially in retail, you know, Walgreens, CVS, so forth, Walmart. Um, and ultimately they'll be cheap enough and miniaturized enough um, to be fairly pervasive so that we can not only diagnose which upper, whether it's respiratory syncytial virus or a flu virus, but also what the antibiotic susceptibility is. Are they, is this flu virus susceptible to Tamiflu or not? Um, that's a capability in this machine today. So again, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Um, and this device works on both of those models today. It's awaiting the FDA emergency use authorization. And I have a plan to implement it in Kaiser as soon as we get that EUA. Uh, chicken and the egg. The EUA is easier to get when they have more field data. Getting field data is really difficult without the EUA. Um, and then uh, finally a shift from how we think about health and disease and how we teach about it. So the way we teach medicine today and the way we practice medicine is by organ system. We have cardiologists, we have nephrologists, we have dermatologists, um, we have rheumatologists, we have oncologists. And this is based upon a four century old anatomist description of dead people, okay? So that's how we learn and that's how we teach and that's how we practice medicine is what we learn from dead people. Well, now that we understand that um, the genome and the transcriptome and the proteome are going to characterize who we are and, and what our risks are, we need to completely transform it. Um, and so I'll use a simple example. There's some researchers here at UCSD and I discovered this in a conversation on a Southwest Airlines flight back from um, uh, New Orleans uh, about a year ago, there's a protein called lamins that we've known for a long time is uh, just structural. There's no functional properties, but it just separates the nucleus from the cytoplasm of the cell, right? Well, wrong. Turns out that point mutations in that protein that separates the nucleus from the cytoplasm cause radically different diseases in different organ systems based upon where the point mutation is. So this inert structural protein has tons of functional characteristics and impacts on health and disease. So we need to really transform, and I, I've, uh, again, I frequently mistake a short, uh, clear view for a short distance. Um, 
I have a very clear view of where we need to go, but I don't know whether it's going to be five years or 20 years before there's a textbook of medicine organized around uh, the omic etiologies of disease rather than the dead people's organ systems as seen through the lens of a pathologist. Um, but it's going to change, and medical school is going to become different. Yes, please. John, I, I very much like to interact with your very positive. Please, absolutely. Um, and uh, like information boost, and I would first like that we come in discussion and uh, so I start with language. So you mentioned uh, several times you like the sonoid concept and the basis, so we should not only be multi-professional, so multilingual. Right. And I come to medicine and uh, we had maybe seven years ago, a um, friend giving a lecture, he called me, he's in bioinformatics and they met something very simple based on this very traditional system of illness they just made accounts. They wanted to know, I had a question, how many illness are existing? How many which? Illness. Uh -huh. The numbers of illness and syndromes. And then had an account number for about 27,000. Right. And I know no MD so far who's capable to... Precisely. ...be precisely in 27,000 illness and syndromes. So then um, they started their scientific work over many years. Now it's about 10 years. It's in downsizing to about 7,000 illness and symptoms. So the boost of information you're giving us brings me to this, um, well, too traditional concept of logic. And um, we discussed very often um, only when I take my little German medical community, and when I only look in medicine, and there's different departments, there's so many different words in language, in medical language, so we don't have a context and syntax to exchange sustainable, honest, transparent information. Right. So, now we are coming to a new area. Right. How will the language system in medicine and in leadership of health change with your knowledge and opinion. I would be very interested. Oh, wow. I wish I could have taken credit for paying you to ask that question because that's, that's one, of, one, of, one of my favorite questions of all and I've spent a lot of my career on that question. So, um, immodestly, um, I'll admit that uh, I'm the founder of the XML standard for interoperability um, of health records around the world. Uh, based on uh, XML constructs, um, and um, I was the first clinician on SNOMED International, which um, is um, a listing of these diseases. SNOMED is a systematic nomenclature of medicine. It was founded by a bunch of pathologists, run by exclusively pathologists. I was the first clinician to actually be on their international board in the mid-90s. It's translated into seven languages, used over 40 countries to do precisely what you're saying, is to have cross-lingual um, normalization of the description of diseases. And so the combination of my XML construct that called the clinical document architecture and the continuity of care document using XML standards is used pretty widely internationally. And SNOMED gets us a long way towards addressing your question but not even close to far enough. So the work group that um, I chair for the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, trying to help establish how to ask the question, how many people with this phenome, these, this, this set of diseases or markers, has this relationship, those three components. So the syntax is, uh, it, it's a classic tuplet. This, um, clinical finding has this association with this genetic finding. So how do we say that we, we still don't have that representation? So we have a sub-work group of my work group, and I was on the phone with uh, people. Uh, scheduling these calls is really difficult, of course, because we've got people from every time zone in the world. So somebody's up at 3 in the morning, and somebody's at midnight, and somebody's at 5 p.m., and so fortunately, um, we have sort of US-centric scheduling. <laughs> so I don't, I'm not the one that has, in Australia, it's 2 a.m. when they're on the line. So last, just, just a couple days ago, we had this exact conversation. And what's happening is, as we begin to understand there's no such thing as a common disease, and we start looking at the genetic foundations of disease, 
and the proteomic manifestations of the disease and the radiologic, the imaging, we're starting, the first paper published this is like 10 years ago, and there are like five, phenot uh, five genotypes of, of uh, liver cancer. And uh, the very first paper on this, as I say, it was, uh, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago, um, showed that you could predict the genotype of a hepatocellular carcinoma from a CT scan of that era, which was like very primitive compared to what we have today, with an 80% accuracy, based upon the imaging of that tumor. So we're beginning to see this hyper granularization of the characterization of what each individual patient has through every type of probe we have for looking at disease. And so how we represent that on the phenomic side is incredibly complex. How we represent that on the genomic side is incredibly complex. And how we represent that as a syntax for, you know, has this relationship. So there's many different types of relationships between the phenome and the genome. The boundaries between the DNA sequences, you know, the, the genome, the phenome, and the epigenome, which is all the environmental influences, which I used to think were, you know, fairly straightforward partitions and concepts, the boundaries are completely blurred. It's like, it's like all oh, getting fused into one continuum of knowledge across all of these types. So to answer your question, um, we have a subgroup that is working, and we have participants from probably 15 countries right now, um, trying to address exactly that question of just on the phenom, this is just on the phenomic side, of we've got this image type, we have a 80% probability it's this type of geno genetics hepatocellular carcinoma. We have this pattern of proteomic information. We have this pattern of lipidome, lipidomic information. Um, and we have these clinical manifestations and these clinical diagnoses. And it has this relationship with these 27 SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms that are genetic markers. Um, so that's what excites me so much about the work um, that we're doing in the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health is precisely this question. And we have every country in the world. Uh, Singapore is a big leader in the space. China, Beijing Genomics Institute, is doing tons of work, but they're a little bit of a black box um, because of their, someone mentioned earlier with Independa, you worry about making money in China because intellectual property doesn't, uh, uh, do, isn't part of their vocabulary. Um, and so this work is getting more and more complex. My prediction is that um, within five to 10 years, this complexity will distill down into fewer and fewer patterns. So we're, we're, we're having this expanding complexity and granularity of knowledge across all of the PLECO system. But what we're gonna start seeing is, what are the therapeutic implications? What are the interventional implications? What are the health implications? And begin to simplify those down into patterns. But we're, we're in this discovery phase, and it's, it's gonna take a while. Um, thank you very much. Um, just try to simplify by a little experience. So what you describe, I would like um, the complexity also of the medical community. Oh, yeah. And um, their, um, their empowerment to influence um, management and health industry and even to influence society by creating their um, own syndrome and language system and with their own scientific um, literature and their own conferences, this is a well-established system. So um, I guess this new age of medicine, um, it's a little more process and I liked very much uh, your chart at the beginning to show how to um, get in performance, which means change in time, and, and um, especially, the, especially time, the, right? the medical community <coughs> is well established and is not running by performance, because they're, yeah. uh, in a way, they're willing to be, in a way, responsible for the patient and the outcome for the patient, and that's their duty, but in, on the extremely, on, in the, to be on the equal, they have the same responsibility for the outcome economically. I, and then I, we are coming yeah. in a new field of performance. 
And I guess this age of performance will come because to finance all this which is needed and which is sustainable, we need better performance of one small hospital, but also of whole <coughs> systems, and we can probably only interact then internationally. So, so I would I, be happy when there are more questions. Right, right. So again, I wish I could have claimed credit for paying you to ask that question because it's, it's one of the central questions of our time. And I actually asked Vinod Kosla, who's one of the biggest venture capitalists in, in healthcare technology and co-founder of Sun Microsystems, that exact question in a different context. And not only did you ask one of my favorite questions, but you gave the perfect lead into my next slide. Um, and so the way I'll answer that is to say that I asked that question of Vinod Kosla uh, at Singularity University when they were still up at Moffett Field in uh, Silicon Valley. And I said, you know, we've known healthcare is terribly broken and we need to fix it for a long time and the costs keep going up and the outcomes aren't getting any better. And, and uh, I've been consulting with a lot of the different big pharmas um, to uh, uh, all pro bono because my position doesn't allow me to uh, get consulting fees. So I do this all pro bono just since I'm being recorded. <laughs> I don't want to get fired because I don't accept any money. Um, but what I've told the pharmaceutical companies is that they are the least trusted partner in healthcare because they push and, and they have a profoundly negative influence on everything that happens in medicine. They fund medical schools, they fund research, they fund conferences, they own the brains through very subtle means of the medical community and are very disruptive in a very negative way. And they get it um, and they want to change. So what I've told them is, in the world of personalized medicine, the first thing that you need to do is to flip that whole equation of you're out there trying to make sure that everybody possible can be on one of your drugs. When you, and I first said this to a pharma five years ago, when you realize that in the world of personalized medicine, multi-omics, that you can have your brand be, we want nobody to be on our drugs unless it's the best drug for them but we want to make sure everybody that is best served by one of our drugs is on our drug, you will flip that trust equation and you will transform this pervasively negative influence in healthcare into a pervasively positive influence. So I asked the question of Vinod Kosa, I said, you know, this is two years ago. So I said, for three years I've been consulting with pharma and saying, you guys, you guys, nobody trusts you. Here's how you fix it. And a couple of the companies are really excited about the concept. And, and, and I said, there's only one company, I, I tell all of them, there's only one company that gets to do this first. And the first one who succeeds at doing this is going to really be the trusted brand and out front. And so hurry up and do it, uh, trying to inspire a little competition amongst them. And uh, so I asked Vinod Kosa, I said, you know, I've been saying this for three years and they're not doing it. Um, and they're still out there pitching, everybody should be on my drug. Um, and I said, how is this gonna change? I mean, help me. And without skipping a beat, uh, Vinod, who's brilliant, said, it's really simple, John. It's not going to come from within the big machine of, of conventional pharma. It's going to be from a startup that they acquire, and it's going to be consumer let me, let me just finish this point if I could. It's going to be consumer driven. The healthcare um, industrial machine is not going to bring about this revolution. The government is not going to bring about this revolution. It is a consumer sensitivity. It is the person-centric view of the world that is going to drive this change and you will see it through startups that are paying attention to not the dollar, not the entrepreneurial opportunity, but how do I transform the world? And we heard that out of the mouths of Independa earlier this morning and that's exactly what's going to bring about that kind of change. It isn't going to be the healthcare industrial complex and Vinod was the first to like educate me to that point and I have seen the truth in that everywhere I go and everywhere I look and um, that is how I believe uh, change is going to happen. It's going to be very sensitive to what individuals need broadly, mind, body, soul, spirit, um, not just from I'm hypertensive, give me a drug, which is the way the medical industrial machine works today. Yeah, please. Well, and uh, concerning the pharmaceutical industry, for over decades they had an high output and they were one of the first in this whole health industry going around the globe. And I'm waiting for that the provider industry which is a 
and, and the key in the hospital industry is also going really sustainable international because this will also, as you said, bring then the change towards the consumer, which in this sense is then the patient to be healed. Right. And um, I've um, a big understanding for this pharmaceutical industry because it's just like any other industry. They are not good or bad. They are just very efficient. Right. They are great. And um, when you come to this basic understanding, which is the key sentence um, of um, national economics, you are driven by interests. And there's one very simple sentence I never forgot. Why to end a golden age? And why to end it when you still believe you live in this golden age, but you are bringing not the future, you're bringing the reality which just starts now. Right, right. So, um, thank you for those brilliant comments. Um, let me just say that I, it was with a great deal of trepidation that I agreed to keynote uh, the American Medical Association's annual lobbying conference uh, two years ago and um, really put these, idea, these same ideas out there. Um, and I was stunned when I got a call three months ago and they said they wanted to have me back to do it again, which I did yesterday morning in New Orleans. Um, I keynoted uh, that same conference with, you know, an updated version of these concepts. And the physicians don't go to medical school because they want to make a lot of money and prescribe a lot of pills. Physicians go to medical, uh, people go to medical school because they want to make the world a better place. And then they find themselves imprisoned in this broken infrastructure and incentive structure. And so um, physicians want out of this prison in a big way. And so the, the incoming, the, the outgoing president of the AMA, uh, Robert Waugh, who's an amazing guy, I had dinner with the night before last, um, and the incoming, Stephen Stack, who's an emergency physician, um, uh, get, get this, they really get it. And they are trying to rally the troops and bring about change within the medical industrial complex through the physician who went into medicine to be a caring person who changes the world rather than someone who just is trying to get by by coding and prescribing um, and getting through their day. Um, there is, for those of you who don't know, there is an epidemic of depression and disillusionment of physicians, um, uh, especially in the U.S. today, because of this prison they live in and they want out. And so the AMA is really interested um, in helping lead that. I think the consumer is going to be the driving force, but we now have fertile soil in the, new in the recent and new leadership of the AMA um, to break, break through some of this. So let me go to my next slide, which was set up by your earlier question. So what are the implications for the pharmaceutical industry? So what's happening with this uh, personalization of medicine is that in every disease state, um, we're finding that there is no such thing as a common disease. So when so someone introduces a new drug, it's going to have a smaller and smaller market share because it's going to be a designer drug more and more. In oncology, we're seeing this already. And how are we going to be able to afford this? So pharmaceutical companies are all over this. I keynote a conference about three months ago that was basically uh, a soon high for pharmaceuticals. And they brought all the ph pharmaceutical companies together and there was deal making going on. They say, oh, you're working on this, we're working on this, let's collaborate. Why? The economics. There's not, they still pay $200 million to develop the average drug, but the market share is shrinking as we're getting into personalized medicine for each individual drug. So um, they get it, there's consolidation, there's collaboration going on big time. What's the risk of that? So those of you who are statisticians know what publication bias is. Pharmaceutical company funds 20 studies, Two tails, uh, students t-test says that one out of 20 is going to give a spuriously positive result. They don't publish 19, they just publish the one positive, they put the drug out there, the FDA says, boy," and we get a bad drug on the market, right? So publication bias by funding lots of studies and only publishing the, the one supporting your drug is potentially going to get much worse with collaboration and consolidation. So that's a huge red flag about what's happening. So my next slide is about what's the implication for the FDA. The FDA is incapable of keeping up with the exponential growth in this inverted big bang, this exponential growth of data and knowledge. They know it. They're really struggling to be able to keep up with, it, with, with this. I mean, here they are sitting on a way to diagnose Ebola before someone's symptomatic, and they have to go through this whole process. And by the way, the board of directors that runs the FDA resembles Congress. 
because that is their board of directors. So changing the FDA is nearly impossible because we rely on Congress agreeing to do something different. But so what I propose the FDA um, in every venue I have an opportunity is they need to find a path to shift who they are from a regulatory agency to a global crowdsourcing agency that certifies people who are experts to manage the information and to help combat the publication bias that's going to escalate radically with the consolidation and collaboration of all the big pharmacists going on today. So um, as each new startup is gobbled up by one of the big pharmas, um, we need to be very concerned about those implications. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, and talk about little data. So big data, I spent a fair amount of time on. Little data is everything that's known about me. So I have terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data about me that are in the database in Stanford based upon a microbiome from uh, my, behind my ear, uh, my tongue, my nose, and my stool um, every three months and whenever I get sick. And I have thousands of blood tests done quarterly and whenever I get sick. Um, and it's, it, it becomes sort of a double whammy when I get sick now because not only am I sick, but I've got to go traipsing up to the lab to get all this uh, these studies done. Um, so I try even harder to stay well. Um, and so the, the little data world is everything about me. And so the future of healthcare is taking all of the knowledge from big data and all of the information about me, the little data, doing the mashup and saying, what's going on with me? What do I know about that? And how do we create clinical decision support that supports me? And ultimately, how do we make that accessible directly to the consumer? So there's a lot of work going on. Vinod Kosla is working with a, um, a, a, someone I uh, refer to as a friend from MIT who's doing a startup in direct -to consumer decision support. And another dear friend of mine here in San Diego, Elizabeth Dreiser, is raising foundation money to try and create direct -to consumer decision support for free um, uh, based upon uh, a model of uh, a not for profit model. And so, so what, what is the little data movement and the quantified self? So Larry Smarr right here at UCSD, the Qualcomm Institute, um, has a team of people working on microbiomics. Um, and I'm going to come back to microbiomics in a, minute, in a moment. But there's increasingly um, a massive amount of information that we can get about each one of us across all of these omics and do the mashup against the knowledge base and really create uh, personalized medicine. So, this is just a graphic showing all the sources of information that we have that, you know, Google and Amazon and Safeway and Kaiser Permanente and Mayo Clinic and others are aggregating into these data lakes in the big data world. And um, this is a picture of Larry Smarr silhouetted against what he calls the wall. So Larry Smarr actually did his PhD in Stephen Hawking's lab. Uh, it was on 40, it was 40 years ago, and it was about the collision of black holes was the, his PhD thesis. Um, he then was the first to develop the first supercomputing supercomputer center in the world. Then he assembled a team that invented virtual reality. And now he's one of the leaders and pioneers in the world of microbiomics. So what is microbiomics and why do, why do we care? Um, it's actually profound because we know that our immune systems have a profound influence on our entire health and wellness and disease manifestations throughout our lifespan. And we know that the immune system is very intimately connected to the brain. Um, we know that the gut is intimately connected to the brain. There's more dopamine receptors in the gut than there are in the brain. Um, and we know that what we eat and how the bacteria that are in our gut process that and the microRNA that constitutes 15% of the circulating microRNA in our bloodstream have a profound influence on our health. So um, what, what is the relevance of the bacteria in our gut? So a couple of factoids. There are 10 times more bacteria in our gut than there are cells in our body. There's 100 times more genes in those bacteria than there are in the human genome. Um, there's about 100 diseases now that have almost a diagnostic fingerprint of the bacteria that are in our stool. And what these are are the phylum. Each one of these breakpoints is a different phylum of bacteria. And each one of these bars is one of the two to 3,000 species that's in our gut that we can identify through, only through sequencing. So every year we're adding more and more bacteria that have never been cultured or seen under a microscope, well, they've been seen but not identified by their genome. And you can actually look at the sequence of bacteria and the genes in our gut and be able to tell whether we're more likely to have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's if we're known to have 
inflammatory bowel disease, and all kinds of related disorders. So this connection between the microbiome, the genome, the immunome, the neurobiome is profound. Um, and there is no such thing as a common disease. There's some researchers at San Diego State here who are looking at the microbiome of our teeth and gingiva and uh, illustrating that there's a profound correlation with what bacteria are in your gums and your risk of heart disease and your risk of dementia. So um, we're just scratching the surface on this stuff. I'm going to shift gears again and I come back to one of the questions that was asked of Independa earlier about you know, with all the streaming data, is this just a fad, you know, from all these wearable sensors? What are we going to do with all this data? And um, so, uh, basically, um, there are a series of thresholds, was the term that was used, and I call them filters or algorithms. Um, and we look at the value, the trend, the aggregate or composite of the data, the trend in that composite, and the natural language processing. Then we look at that for each individual. So we're going to be establishing nomograms for each one of us. Not, so what happens today is uh, the normal ra reference set range for lab value is based upon the average of a population. Well, my wife, when, if um, she has a temperature of 98.6, she's really febrile. Same with my daughter because they run 97.4, 97.5 all day long. So we're going to have personalized diurnal patterns of nomograms for each one of us. And then what we need to do is not have a physician or a human screen this data. We need to take this data and have filters and algorithms and process and say, this is an outlier and you need to pay attention to this. So I'm going to wrap it up here pretty quickly um, because it's getting close to lunch. Um, but I talked about how we need to humanize how we use the data, and Independent did a, did a great job about that. Um, so I'm not going to belabor that point, but to say that the data and the knowledge and the information and the decision support is great, but we need to be able to humanize how we motivate people to change their lifestyle um, towards healthier um, habits. Um, this is my construct for uh, the four tiers of pervasive sensing real-time tuning for the athlete and the warrior, uh, monitoring people after, during hospitalizations and immediately post-discharge, chronic illness, and then restoring wellness through mindfulness. And I want to come back to the survey I did earlier where only half of you are still wearing a pedometer of any sort. And the reason for that is we don't want digital nannies. We want things that motivate us to have healthier habits. So my recommendation to anybody wearing a Fitbit or any kind of pedometer is don't count your steps every two hours or every day and say, oh, gosh, I need to do 200 more steps before I go to bed tonight. Extend that period of time between which you look at how many steps you need so that you introduce an unconscious mindfulness. So instead of saying, wow, I need 200 more steps today, you know, you, you get so good at doing it that you only have to look every week or every month. Um, but get to the point where unconsciously you see the elevator and you go to push the button, you go, wait a minute, I'm going to take the stairway, okay? Um, and instead of sitting all day in a conference room or an auditorium, um, you stand in the back. One of, one of my personal missions is to get 30% of all auditoriums in the country to have standing desks in the back of the room. Um, and uh, because sitting is the new smoking. And so how do we, how do we um, use sensing to help motivate people and how do we personalize and, and use persuasive technologies? B.J. Fogg at Stanford is the expert in this um, to get people to do all this. But in the end, we'll still need the sensors for um, three things. Initiation of healthy habits, motivation throughout the transformation of behavior, and then calibration so that periodically we make sure, yep, we're still hitting our goals. Um, so it's not to say ignore technology, but it's to say use it to motivation. There are three conversations we need to support. One is between the person or patient and their professional care team. I, I, I use patient in this context. The patient with their personal care team and then the patient with a person that houses the patient persona, because there is such a thing as a patient persona. How many times have you had an elderly relative and you say, Mom, what the doctor say? I don't know, I was so upset. He was telling me that I had cancer and I couldn't hear a word he said after that. Well, that's where Open Notes comes in, because then you can say, Mom, let's look, at, let's look at what the doctor said. You can go online, you can get the note that the doctor said, and you can have a conversation. And with, a, with your personal support network around you, you can have the conversation between the patient and the person. Um, persona um, with a support of technology. So those are the, th the uh, three conversations that need to occur, occur. And I'm writing a chapter in a book right now on uh, future roles in healthcare um, after the digital transformation. And what I see um, 
is that we're going, it's sort of a back to the future. We're going to be able to have the technology take all the hard work out of our day and allow us to go back to the country doctor who made house calls, not, not necessarily house calls, but virtual care um, with video communication for that human touch. Um, and be able to elicit what are the values of the individual and address those values. Um, so Tulga Wande in his recent book talked about this. Um, it's something I've uh, been very sensitive to and, and Atul is brilliant and I love everything he does. The only issue I take with him is he presents these ideas um, as being novel when in fact a good physician 100 years ago knew that if they didn't listen to the patient and understand where they lived, they couldn't best address their needs. And so um, we've lost a lot of that in the uh, technology um, and the technocracy associated with healthcare delivery, and we need to restore that. We need to be able to very quickly identify what an individual's values and objectives are. We need then to be able to array from these complex decision support systems and the mashup of the big data and the little data, create um, visualizations of different options. And the example I like to use is you've got a 45-year-old woman who shows up and you diagnose hypertension and diabetes for the first time, and your decision support system says, here's the three different options for how you could treat this. Option A is highest benefit, greatest potential risk, and you really need to get engaged with changing your behavior. Option C is that minimal risk, you know, pretty good benefit, and you can still have your sedentary lifestyle. And option B is somewhere in between those two. And this 45-year-old mother says, well, my daughter's getting married in three months. I want option C until my daughter's married and I get all the family out of the city and then I can focus on me again and then I want option A. So what's relevant to an individual is based on their value set, their objectives and their social context and their physical context. And so we need to be able to, to do that and I'm working with some various folks in the visualization field to help drive that. There's a couple of startups that are, that are working on this and shared health records. Um, so what do we know about what the opportunities are for you know, health and longevity? Uh, how many people have heard of Blue Zones? Okay, two, both in independent. <laughs> um, and uh, this is old literature. So these uh, cities in Japan, Italy, Costa Rica, Greece, and here at Loma Linda in California have much higher health as a community, much longer longevity than anywhere else, and there have been intensive research on why is that, and they look at what are the factors in the community, the social determinants of health, and the cultural determinants of health, and the physical determinants of health, and what they found is a couple of commonalities. Fresh, um, local food, uh, uh, Pollen has written about this extensively, you know, the sort of healthy local fresh. Um, Regular exercise, and we know from studies of exercise in DNA that one of the few ways you can increase the methylation of your DNA broadly is through daily exercise. It actually, being more methylated is a really good thing. Um, sleep. So we've known for a long time that regular sleep habits is really good. We know that pilots that fly east-west, same schedules as pilots who fly north-south but without the time zone changes, have much more cardiovascular disease because we disrupt their sleep-wake cycles. Um, but now we've, we've learned that one of, the, one of the primary benefits of sleep in the supine position is that the clearance rate of the circulation of the cerebrospinal fluid through the arachnoid plexus um, is that we clear beta amyloid out of our cerebrospinal fluid at vastly increased rates while we're supine and, and sleeping effectively. And so there is um, profound evidence that that's related to the development of Alzheimer's and dementia. And there's profound evidence that good sleep helps. Um, we also know the circadian rhythm is critical um, for uh, normal melatonin levels. And there's great circumstantial evidence that the epidemics of breast cancer and prostate cancer around the world track perfectly with the introduction of both light, electric light, uh, over the course of time, and with night shifts. So people who um, have irregular sleep patterns are disrupting their melatonin dramatically. We know that in vitro, um, that for both prostate and, and uh, breast cancer, that uh, uh, physiologic doses of melatonin can uh, suppress um, the carcinogenic aspects of breast and uh, prostate cancer. So um, sleep cycles are important. And finally, social, having healthy social relationships and Fowler's work um, is a brilliant um, explication of 
of those. So those four factors we know in blue zones are important. I'm going to go very quickly through the last few slides and let everyone go to lunch here in a sec. Um, community and population health. So there's a lot of, you know, there's the Clinton Global Initiative, there's the uh, Bill Gates Foundation doing all that. There's all these foundations. And if you haven't heard of it, there's a, um, there's a play on words. Uh, instead of Live Aid, there's a book by uh, Dembaya Musa, who, who's uh, is titled Dead Aid. And it talks about how these foundations take their hammers and they go to developing countries and say, I've got a hammer and I, I see a nail that I'm going to hit. And we sort of, we're sort of imposing, and not to criticize either Clinton or Bill Gates because they're doing amazingly fabulous work, but what we need, and again, it comes back to Soon High and the Plico system uh, notion is we need to have an evidence-based model, not just for clinical care, but we need to have an evidence basis for uh, community health assessment tools to look at what the gaps are in a community the social determinants of health, to validate those gaps with a community, to do benchmarking um, of different communities with each other, to do local capacity assessments. So we, but we know what the problems are, but what's their capacity for change and focus? Um, their local appetite and their values and priorities, analytics to sequence and synergize the, the tools that we bring to bear to change the health of the community. Um, we need a match.com for governmental, non-governmental, and foundational work to bring the right synergy of tools together. And then we need to have validated metrics for progress. So the goal is not to come in and fix a community. The goal is to come in and understand what their needs are to change those needs, help them address those needs, and create self-sufficiency and resilience rather than the great knight white who comes riding in on the horse, fixes everything, and runs off to the next community. It's building self-sufficiency and resilience. So let me give a couple examples. These are heat maps that we've done with our members at Kaiser Permanente, San Francisco Bay Area. These are hot spots for obesity, asthma, and depression. The thing to note is they're not the same. So a single community is not equally bad for each of these diseases, just to show again, there's, there's a lot of variation between communities um, that's different for different diseases. So we need to be able to have this evidence-based assessment and introduction of tools to fix these problems. And that's why one of my bad habits of coining new terms, I've created the, the, the term of behavioral symphony of wellness. So we need to be able to um, bring together a symphony of tools like Independa and others that help overcome all of the billboards that say, you deserve a break today, go eat a, reward yourself for all your stress with a Big Mac. That is the worst thing to do. So we need to overcome this behavioral symphony of disease that exists today for sedentary um, lifestyles with poor sleep, poor diet, and overcome it with a behavioral symphony for wellness and mindfulness. And I'm going to skip this slide, uh, but basically much, we need to pay much more attention to the social determinants of health. And Bhutan's model of gross national happiness is an incredible um, uh, innovation in 1972. Two Canadians actually led that. And we need a new ecosystem of evidence-based compassionate action. Um, we need to be able to know um, what to communicate, how we communicate, when to communicate through virtual visits, pervasive video, and address the social determinants of health. And, and I'm, I'm working with a bunch of startups to do all the stuff where we can assess people's values and objectives and give them a video that helps them understand what to do that's humorous, if they respond to humor, that's directive, if they like to have someone tell them what to do, that's interactive if they want to have a dialogue and share decision making, but basically customize everything, everything about how um, the, the interface between professionals um, and people. Um, I'm going to skip that. So I'm finally to close, I'm going to ask the question, so how will big data and analytics and genomics and panoramics and personalized medicine and the mashup of big data and little data and all these technologies, pervasive sensing, how is it going to affect human evolution? So the first one sort of reflects the first tier of my pervasive sensing taxonomy, and that is the super athlete warrior. And I call it homometricus. Um, and uh, this is where we're just tuning ourselves for just perfect resilience and health. The second one is something that many of us in this room resemble, I certainly do, and I've coined it homo geekus. Um, and it's the sedentary lifestyle, which is why I'm trying to get uh, every auditorium in the country to convert the last 30% of the room into standing desks. The next is courtesy of the McDonald's, and I call it homo fast fooder us. 
Um, and this is the outcome that we see today with, um, ironically, the metaphor of the pig and a python. We've got this whole age wave of obese children who are going to drive up healthcare costs in the current model um, for decades to come. And then finally, technology itself is not the answer. So something went terribly wrong when we invented the flat panel display. So <laughs> technology itself is not the solution. So lastly, I'm going to show a very quick video clip. Um, and bear with me for a second here, and I'm going to get the sound on and get to um, a video from a fo uh, someone from... Uh, Professor of Neurobiology at UCLA, and Deepak Chopra. Now, I've worked with people a long time across the lifespan, even in their 90s, and they can change if they're inspired to change. To change your life, you have to change your mind. And the good news is, you can. Your brain cells have the power to build new pathways that will reinforce what you learn and do, including better health habits. This power is called neuroplasticity. Apologize, neuroplasticity sure. is the way the brain changes its structure in response to experience. Experience always means energy and information is flowing through the nervous system. So whenever you think experience, you have to think of neural firing. What we know is that when neurons repeatedly fire together, they wire together. Brain cells, or neurons, pass impulses through branching arms called dendrites to other neurons. They can grow and form new, more efficient pathways. When you make a decision repeatedly, your brain forms a shortcut, helping the habit become nearly automatic. So you do something, um, continue. Um, my apologies that the video um, display did not work. I am going to restart it because the video actually is, is um, yeah, you go, if you don't mind restarting it and then I go full screen. I don't know why it is about half the time this works and the other half it doesn't. I've worked with people a long time across the lifespan, even in their 90s, and they can change if they're inspired to change. To change your life, you have to change your mind. And the good news is, you can. Your brain cells have the power to build new pathways that will reinforce what you learn and do, including better health habits. This power is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the way the brain changes its structure in response to experience. Experience always means energy and information is flowing through the nervous system. So whenever you think experience, you have to think of neural firing. What we know is that when neurons repeatedly fire together, they wire together. Brain cells, or neurons, pass impulses through branching arms called dendrites to other neurons. They can grow and form new, more efficient pathways. When you make a decision repeatedly, your brain forms a shortcut, helping the habit become nearly automatic. So you do something, um, continuously, whatever it is, a certain habit of reflection, a certain habit of thinking or feeling or doing, um, that will rewire your nervous system and then you'll have a new habit. It's called long-term hetero and homosynaptic potentiation of neurons. I mean, that's the neural correlate of creating a habit, a new habit. You can't get rid of a habit unless you create a new habit. What this all means is, Healthy choices lead to more healthy choices. So thanks for the uh, AV support to get me there. Now let me get back to my, I'm just going to have a few closing slides and we'll be done here. Um, so the significance of that, um, I may need AV help to get back to my PowerPoint now. <laughs> Thank you, if you could help me get out of this. So the, the, the point of that video, and um, it, it's, it, to me it's really powerful, is that we can use modern technology to help shape 
healthy habits um, and um, really begin to create wellness and resilience um, rather than, now you see my messy desktop, um, <laughs> it's okay, um, without, without having to have more visits to the doctor and more hospitalizations. So we can really begin to modify behavior um, in ways that our brain is wired to accept and that the evidence supports um, as a path to uh, health, wellness, and resilience. Okay, let me, let me go ahead and just, uh, while, while he's working, then in case you can get it back, I'll just, just close it out with um, uh, two quotes. Um, one is hanging on the wall of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C., and it's from Hubert Humphrey, and it says, the moral test of a government is how it treats those in the dawn of life, the children, uh, those in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those in the shadows of life, um, those with disease and disability. Um, and I think that a part of what we need to do as entrepreneurs and as healthcare professionals um, and those who care about the health of our communities um, is to um, really engage at the community level and uh, bring about health through what we know from Blue Zones and use the technology to reinforce that. Um, so, uh, oh, this is the wrong, <laughs> wrong PowerPoint. Um, and then I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and close this out. Um, but um, the last quote is from Maya Angelou and uh, the Poet Laureate and, and Maya, uh, so eloquently said that people won't remember um, what you did, uh, people won't remember what you said, they will remember how you made them feel. And I think that that needs to be our goal in healthcare, is to restore empathy, uh, to restore caring, to restore looking at the values of the individual and using all this technology to support their values and objectives and presenting things in ways 